to sort of kick things off real quick, my name is Chris McCall. I'm director of the CERN and Earth and Space Center at Triton College. Uh, before we jump into the meeting, we're always pleased to be able to work with the Chicago Astronomical Society and anybody else with astronomy interests. Um, several people have already asked me this evening about uh, what is the status at the Space Center? Are we open yet? The truth is, is that we had set a date in August. We were this close to being open and we were asked to wait a little bit. And I understand the logic and the reasoning for it, but we have now been asked to set a new date. So right now we are looking at resuming public programs starting on Saturday night, October the 9th. We're gonna start slow with just two shows on Saturday night and build up from there because we're also covering on-site school groups, college classes, and a lot of virtual field trips. So check the website and Facebook to get the most up-to-date information. Uh, let's see here. I'm trying to think of what I have forgotten to mention. Anyway, um, I could say lots and lots and lots of things about Theo Wellington because <laughs> I had the chance to work with her for many, many years while I was in Tennessee and uh, Maybe I'll share some of those stories a little bit later. But uh, I think what I'm going to do right now is turn it over. Oh, uh, is turn it over to James Kuka, who's actually going to do his introduction for Theo Wellington. If you think of questions during the course of the presentation, type them into the chat, and uh, maybe I can uh, jump in and interrupt her. Uh, so let's go from there. I'm trying to think of what, if there are any other ground rules. Anyway, everybody, behave yourselves, have fun. It's okay to laugh and uh, enjoy. James, it's your show now. Hey, thank you, Chris. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, welcome to the September. 2021 meeting of the Chicago Astronomical Society, which is being hosted by the CERNIN Earth and Space Center. Our speaker tonight is Theo Wellington. Theo is a longtime officer member of the National Nashville Barnard Seifert Astronomical Society. Theo received her bachelor's degree in astronomy from Case Western Reserve University in 1981. She coached almost 15 years of the Science Olympiad. She also spent seven years at both the old and new Sudakim Planetarium in Nashville. She conducted eclipse outreach for Western Kentucky University in 2017 and is currently a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador providing educational programs at parks and libraries. She also um, is an advocate for improved nighttime lighting, an issue very close to CAS. Um, uh, we, we, big deal for us. Uh, and uh, she, she does this through the International Dark Sky Association. Um, and tonight she is going to talk about um, her excursion to La Silla Observatory in Chile for the July 2nd, 2019 solar eclipse. She and her husband went, a par went as part of a team uh, conducting white light and polarized observations of the solar corona. Um, the, this trip grew out of her outreach with uh, Western Kentucky University in 2017. We really appreciate um, Theo um, helping us out um, in our mission to um, provide astronomy exposure, exposure to the Chicago area public. Without further ado, I will turn the meeting over to Theo Wellington. Thank you. 
All right. Well, thank you, Jim. Um, yeah, Chris and I go back a ways, and, and all of it was tremendous fun. Well, except for a few times, but we don't talk about that. Um, I want to thank her. She sent me some stuff recently, and in particular, swag at planetarium conferences is great stuff. And this pen, which does this cool thing. Let's see if I can make it do it. Look at that. It has a little red light so you can see what you're writing in the dark. That is so cool. Anyway, Digitalis, we love them. Good. So, yeah, let's see if I can share the screen here. Um, well, I know I can, but let's see how well this works. All right. Well, actually, there's two different ways I can do this, huh? There's screen and there's PowerPoint. Yeah, we'll try that one and see which one works. I hate choices. I thought you were the technological genius. Eh, well, you know, it's different every time, I think. All right. So hopefully you guys can now see the PowerPoint. Yes, we can. All right. So I, I titled this Standing in the Shadow to See the Light, right? Because it's only when we stand under the shadow of an eclipse of the moon that we can see the light of the corona. So that's kind of the, the fun thing. It's never really dark, right? All right, so then I have to go over here, click, and now I can go. So yeah, we're there to look at the, uh, the corona. And, and in particular, so the surface of the sun, you know, averages about, you know, 56, 5700 Kelvin. All right, but the corona, on the other hand, is one or two million degrees. And so there's always been sort of a head-scratching problem. How do you make that tenuous gas that darn hot starting from the surface of the sun? And there are lots of competing theories and not enough data to really show which one is the correct answer, or maybe it's some of all of them. So observations of the corona during eclipse are, you know, something that's kind of fun to do. We can't generally observe the really close corona. We have coronagraphs in space, um, so they block the sun with a disk, and that blocks that inner corona. So that we have two different uh, fields, as it were. So you can kind of see those there, and the white circle is the actual size of the sun. So what we were looking at with the eclipse is everything that's inside those disks, so that we can get really, really close right down to the surface of the sun. All right. Now, in 2017, there was a, an experiment done. People looked at this wonderful path all the way across the country and said, um, you know what, we could do some fun science with that. Because while normally you only get your two minutes or whatever in totality to do observations, if instead you put identical gear all the way across the country in that path, you would now have 90 minutes of observation. And so the Citizen Kate experiment was, was grown out of that idea. 2,500 miles, 60 telescopes, 90 minutes of totality. And it was to make, they wanted it to be citizen science. So they wanted to involve teachers, students, both at the college and secondary level. And uh, I really like this because they had little icons across the bottom here for different places. So all the way from the coast of Oregon, the mountains, the plains, there's Nashville next to the arch. We got our big guitar there. And all the way out to uh, South Carolina. And this was a citizen science rig. These are some students in training here. Um, not a really big setup. Uh, a Celestron mount, a Daystar provided uh, refractor, a point gray camera on the back, a monochrome camera, a laptop and a little bit of software, and that's really all it was. Um, the hardest part of doing your observations, because again, you gotta be set up and you're gonna run during the eclipse, is to get the telescope lined up so that the sun stays still. Now, I don't know if anybody on the call does astrophotography, but um, that is not a mount that you would buy for that. That is like the cheapest thing that Celestron makes. They donated a bunch of them, though, so, you know, that was the good part. But I cheerfully could have thrown the one that I had off the side of the hill. Um, 
and I am not a mount snob. I do not have, you know, Paramount or anything like that, but anyway. But it was a real simple setup, and the idea was to train people, and that hopefully at the end of this they could, you know, have the gear then to do further outreach with. And uh, so that's how they went forward with it. Uh, there was some software that was developed that kind of stepped people through the process so that they could, you know, have a real organized way to remember what step, what step, what step. And uh, so it showed you what the camera was seeing. You know, it took some test frames to make sure that the camera was firing correctly. And uh, at the end of it, what you got was a very high definition HDR image of the sun. And to do that, um, you're taking images, a whole sequence, that are at very different exposures because the corona goes from very faint to very bright. And so to get all of it, you have to really go with a lot of different exposures, in this case, eight. And we'll look at some of those in a little bit. But that's kind of how that whole thing, and it was a MATLAB uh, application that was written for an Arduino, and that was good and bad, too. But the basic thing was that the people would get this gear as a package. The package was 3645. That included everything you needed. And they didn't want anybody to use anything different. They were trying to keep everything as much the same as they possibly could. And they wanted to make all the data public domain after the whole experiment was over. So it was, it was interesting, and so the gentleman that I was working for in Kentucky doing completely different things was the state coordinator for the CATE project. So one Saturday we, we spent time with some of the teams. Literally, we, we were there when they got the gear, unpacked it, helped them assemble it. How do you uh, polar align a telescope when you're out in the middle of the daytime? Don't do that. <laughs> but anyway, people had to learn. So... Uh, out of all the sites, we were incredibly lucky in 2017. Only a few sites were completely clouded out. They actually got data back from almost everybody. So 62 sites got data from all across the country. That was the easy part. The hard part is combining that data and making it into something And this is some of the initial results. Um, the top frame is kind of a single, that's what the corona looked like. The bottom is when you take that image and do some really interesting sharpening to the picture to bring out the really fine detail. And there is now a paper, and I can cheerfully share this link that you can go to and look at some of what they found out. Um, and this is a little animation that go, runs actually both directions, forward and backwards, that shows some of the movement that they could see in the corona during those 90 minutes. Ooh, nice. So that was, it was, it was a great idea, and it was a, actually executed probably about as well as it could be. So some people wanted to do polarimetry with that. The nice thing about looking at the polarized light is that that tells you something about how the electrons are moving in those magnetic fields that are all over the place. Now, the one they had for Citizen Kate was a little pricey, $7,000. That's, that's kind of what most people would not buy for a one-off type of thing. So although one was used, actually, I think two or three were used, but a lot of those sites ended up getting clouded out. There's something about having only two or three, but on one of the images was not too bad. And again, they assigned colors to the different directions of polarization. But technology moves apace, and it turns out that instead of $7,000, you can get one for about $2,300, which is starting to get more reasonable. So this is a camera where instead of having the RGB filter like your normal camera has, this one has a little matrix that instead has every four pixels has all four polarization states. Ooh. And that's kind of interesting. They did not make this for astronomy. Why do you use polarized sunglasses? Because you get glare off stuff. And a lot of these companies are making cameras for machines that are working in industry. 
and they need to be able to not have glare in them. They need to be able to see clearly. And some of the cameras are being used to watch you when you're sitting, oh, say, at the traffic light. And they don't want to see the glare off your windshield. They want to see, are you talking on the phone? Are you wearing your seatbelt? So anyway, that's the sort of thing these are actually useful for. But we were co-opting it for, for doing astronomy. So yeah, there's the, each four pixels has an overlay. It actually used the same chip as the Kate Mono cameras, so that's kind of fun. So, um, at a breakfast at a workshop before the 2017 eclipse, there was a gentleman from Chile. There were actually several people there. They wanted to see what was going on in the States so that they could plan for their event just two years later. And... Uh, he remarked that the 2019 eclipse crossed over several of the observatories. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. There's no way that I could possibly get there. And normally there wouldn't have been a way. La Silla is a very special place. It's the oldest of the European Southern Observatories. And I always love this. This is an astronomy picture of the day, an APOD. They have a big radio dish there, and somebody took a picture of the Milky Way reflected in the dish. And I've always thought that's just an outstandingly pretty photo. And, and that observatory began, uh, well, now it's 52 years ago. About the time when I would have started hearing about it was when I was starting in astronomy. And I always thought, gee, that's a great reason to be in astronomy is you get to go to cool places. So. I kind of had heard about it for years and thought, man, that'd be a heck of a good place to be. Well, as it turned out, they were holding a party because it was their 50th anniversary in 2019. So that's kind of fun. Um, there's a, a little picture of the mountain and a layout of the numerous scopes that they have up there. So in having the party, they said, okay, we're going to have an eclipse. We're going to invite a thousand people to the mountain. And those tickets went in seconds. So I didn't get one of those either because I, I did look at that. Um, but they're also, we, they were sponsoring a couple of science experiments, which I had no idea about. But uh, they, they asked for proposals. And it turned out that one of the people that had done polarization in 2017 submitted a proposal and it was accepted. So that was really fun. Um, there were seven experiments going on that day, and we were one of those. And we were the only one from the United States. Although our, our crew included, you know, a uh, woman herself, Padma Yanamandra Fisher, is from India. Uh, we had a gentleman who started in Algeria. So we had a kind of a multicultural, a very American crew. So we were there to do polarization. And eventually got to Chile. So I eventually got to a place I never expected to be for this event. I mean, it was on the bucket list. Someday we're going to go to Chile, tour the observatories, but not to actually be there and doing some science. So that was just all sorts of cool and extra. And, and when I got the email from Richard, hey, Padma wants to go. She needs two people who can buy their own airplane tickets. I can't go. Do you think you and Roy want to go? Um, I didn't take a whole long time to go. That is a totally bucket list thing. Of course we're going. One thing that Theo has neglected to mention is that Roy is also a major, <laughs> major astro fanatic. Uh, and so yep. the two of them with astronomy degrees, hardcore. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think she had to twist his arm. Nope. Um, and we work well together. I, I'm more the, I'm the gearhead, and, and he actually is more the uh, theoretical person. But the two approaches together often work very well. So we flew into Santiago, which is a big city, and it reminds you of L.A., especially L.A. before they got ser more serious about uh, air pollution. It sits in a bowl, and you can definitely see the haze layer over the city. But driving out of the city... It reminds you very much of California because you've got the ocean and then the rise to the Andes is really pretty quick. And so they have uh, a lot of grapes grown 
They're famous for their wines, but there are a lot of young vineyards. This was one that we passed on the way. But otherwise, it's kind of arid. You know, it's, it's very much deserty, right down to the ocean. So we drove from Santiago about five hours north to the town of La Serena. And La Serena is a beautiful port city. It's got a lovely natural bay. It reminded me very much of any um, resort city that you've been to. There are condos for rent on the beach, um, you know, a nice beach, a lot of restaurants, nightlife, all that sort of thing. Um, on the hill overlooking the bay, um, there's a huge cross. There's a church there that uh, we later went to visit. And uh, it's, a, it's a, you know, fairly big city. Not quite Nashville size, but it's not small either. And of course, this was the off season because even though it was July, that's winter there in the Southern Hemisphere. And La Serena itself was in the path of totality. So it was gonna have a party and they were getting ready for that. Um, some totally unique sights. This guy is operating a puppet for want of a better word, a giant puppet who is wearing eclipse glasses. <laughs> So that was just a ton of fun. Of course, he was accepting tips. Um, there were banners along the road, um, and you can notice the uh, full cutoff lights. Since they have the observatories, they have full cutoff lighting. Uh, Spencer Buckner reminded me that a lot of this got put through back in the days when they had kind of a dictator in charge. And some things are easy to do when you're a dictator, like say, we're going to have observatories in the hills, so you guys are going to turn your lights down. And, Spencer uh, Buckner is an astronomy professor at Austin P. State University in Clarksville. And I, and I actually, thank you for that. And I actually borrowed, I didn't own a Kate rig, and we were taking those with us, so I borrowed his. He was kind enough to let me take his oh. to Chile, so <clears throat> that was really nice of him. Um, there were ads. Um, this particular one asks and you, where will you see the eclipse? And of course, there were lots for sale for you to do exactly that. So it, all in all, it was kind of fun to see them getting ready. This was going to be the big event in town. They were going to, you know, use the soccer stadium and uh, local astronomer to give a speech and everybody to come there. Um, and look at the billboard. It's look at where the lights are. They're pointed down. That's Yay. so much fun. I know. Um, what I heard afterward is that the town about doubled its population for the eclipse. So we were coming in a few days ahead. So really the giant surge had not much begun. Although when we got off the plane, okay, first of all, everybody had an eclipse t-shirt on on the plane. Secondly, you never saw so many Pelican cases with gear come off of a, you know, out of the plane, just out of the luggage. Everybody was bringing gear. Um, the restaurants had signs up. Everybody was kind of into it. And in the square in the middle of town, there's a park. And in the park, they had this big tent set up with vendors. Of course, you had vendors. But the cool thing was, on the outside here of the, the vendor tent are educational plaques, each one with a part, what's going on during the eclipse, and what's the, what, you know, and some information for people. So you could get the whole eclipse thing just by walking along and reading that. So that was very nice. And there were stations where you could, as a tourist, get information. And since Chile is actually growing what they call astrotourism, um, they had all the different places where you could go to observe and where to go to get more information. Uh, this was fun because uh, the Hugo Solar Eclipse Solar Juice, Solar Eclipse Juice, okay, at your cafe juice bar there. Um, we did have one member of our crew that spoke fluent Spanish, which was good. Generally, a lot of people speak enough English to get by. And a lot of things, I don't know, you can, you can suss it out from the Latin roots, right? So ambulancia, you don't need help with. Um, informaciones, you don't need help with. 
Carabineros, I had already learned was the police, and Bomberos, I didn't have a clue, so I had to ask, what is that? Fire department. And so, okay, now I've connected bomb and fire department in my head, but that's kind of fun. Um, the hotel had a card that I had not seen before. What to do in case of an earthquake? And, you know, Part of it that was fun was, if the earthquake makes it difficult for you to keep standing, be prepared to start the evacuation to the tsunami evacuation zone. Okay, so, and the evacuation will be on foot. Don't go looking for your car to do this. And then they showed you where you had to get to. And once you left the hotel, there were actually some signs, like this is, you can't turn right except during the evacuation for a tsunami. And this one I really liked. I mean, you don't need to know any Spanish really here. You got running person, you got wave, and 1,600 meters is how far you gotta go, which is about a mile. So a mile that way, go run. And I think you would do that pretty quick um, in that. Wow. And it's really obvious. I mean, there's flat and then the hill. So you know where you're going. We actually did not have any earthquakes while we were there. Um, at night, there's the cross on the hill lit up. Um, again, seaside resort, so lots of people out walking at night. Um, the temperature was very mild. Again, very Californian. It was cool, but not cold. Now, the water's cold, just like it is off California, but, uh, but the air itself was very nice, so it was really pretty nice to be out and walk around. Uh, the next day, we took two cars as it ended up because uh, we had way too much luggage for the thing we rented at the airport, it turned out. And we took off up the road. The main road north and south in Chile is the Inter-American Highway, and it's the equivalent of an interstate, and it's a toll road. So every so often, you come to a toll booth, you throw some coins in the basket, and at every toll booth, they were handing out information about the eclipse. So this was the, the piece we got, and I, I thought it was fun to see what they said. That's kind of the standard side with just an eclipse picture, because it says don't drink and drive, use your seatbelt, do the speed limit, don't litter, don't park on the side of the road, and plan your trip in advance, which is all good advice. But it's a very nicely maintained highway, um, again, it, pretty much exactly like driving on an interstate, and they drive on the right side of the road. So we actually did our own driving and it was fine. Um, one of our crew did like to go about 10 kilometers an hour over the limit, but we were fine. So the landscape is really pretty. Again, you have uh, a lot of sand dunes on the ocean side and then mountains looking inward and uh, arid landscape, cacti, some planted in fences. So there's La Serena, and we were headed up Route 5 to the town of La Hiera, which is uh, right there on the blue center line. There we go. So that was our first stop. It's about a three-hour trip from La Serena to the observatory, but we stopped for some lunch there and, and just to see what was going on. So it was June 30, July 2 is the eclipse, and there was still no one here. It's a small, small town. They were still actually putting the finishing touches on some of the uh, stuff for the eclipse. This guy is still laying tile on a stage. But uh, two days from then, it was packed. So we handed out some solar glasses since we had a pile of them around. And I said, had some lunch, looked around. I, I would have, I haven't really seen good pictures of the town. You know, everybody takes pictures of the eclipse and not so much of the crowd or what was really going on there. But it was just weird that there's nobody here today, but tomorrow is going to be very different. So there's where La Silla is up in the mountains. And again, a very pleasant drive. Um, I have had worse drives to observatories in California, 
uh, than this one. And still billboards advertising what was going on, windmills. Um, if you could call it an advantage, one advantage of just now developing your infrastructure is you can start with what's now. So solar power and wind power are being very heavily developed. And this is really good because it's such a rural population. As soon as you move off the coast, the places are very uh, sparsely you know, populated, long distances between. So decentralized things work a little bit better. This was going to be a viewing site. And there, again, there's nobody here, but they put up the letters for everybody to pose in front of. And you can see the big row of porta potties in the back. So again, very surreal to be driving by this and knowing that it's going to be absolutely jam-packed with people in just two days. Um, and again, do you need Spanish to know that that way is the observatory and the other way is the photovoltaic park or solar farm? <laughs> and, you know, pretty good size installation. That was one of our first looks at the mountain. We are still probably 25 kilometers away at this point. Woon. And, and yeah, you're just looking across all these hills and hey, look at that. It had actually been raining earlier in the day and you know, you can see the clouds and two days out, I am fine with that. Get that out of the way right then, that's fine. Um, you stop at the bottom, they have, uh, they call it the base camp. Uh, we had a driver from uh, La Serena that was driving the second car. He had to stop and fill out some paperwork, you know, who are you, why are you here, all that sort of thing. Um, but this is where they were going to have everyone park on Eclipse Day, and then they were going to move those thousand people up the peak with their buses. Because otherwise, it's a two-lane road, and there's no parking on the mountain. So... But our driver was a young man um, who, who does, you know, occasionally rent out to drive. And he was just thrilled because, you know how you never visit the places in your own city? So he'd never been up to the observatory, and he was just thrilled to be there. It was a whole new experience for him. So, and he was a really nice, nice guy, good driver. So from here, it's 20 kilometers from base camp to summit. And you can see where you're going to go. <laughs> You can see the winding road, and uh, you're sort of thinking, wow, that's, um, that's some pretty sparse landscape. Is there anything really living in all that? And the answer is yes. So <laughs> we, we called this the borough checkpoint. Um, they were in the road checking us out, and they take their time to go wherever it is they want to go, so you just kind of wait for them to meander off. Uh, you know, people brought these to the land to haul things up and down, and then they got let go, and now they're wild. And somehow they managed to survive with not a whole lot to eat out there. These are our native, they're not llamas, they're guanaco, which is just another kind of llama, really, but also kind of cute and running around the landscape. When we finally got up the mountain, uh, they had us staying in what they called dormitories, which I don't think had been used for many, many years. But that's okay. Um, you could get a sense of the old time experience of when people actually had to go to the mountain to make their observations. Nowadays, everything is so computerized that the, com the telescopes all have people that run them. You really just tell them what observation you want, and they do it, and then it's recorded. And you don't have to be there. I don't know why you wouldn't want to be there, but you don't have to. So the dormitories kind of go unused nowadays, but um, it was a fun place to be. And it was nice of them to, they gave us, for being an accepted project, they gave us three nights on the mountain, all the food while we were there, and it was good food too. Um, and, and you're at this really cool place, so... Um, we got there in the late afternoon, drove out towards where we were going to be, and, and this guy just dominates the landscape. He's the big telescope at the peak of the hill, uh, 3.6 meter telescope. So the observatory is laid out, uh, it snakes along the ridge. And that's where the dormitories were, the red star there. 
From there, we were traveling further up the ridge towards the big telescope, but ending below it. And there had been, their old visitor center was there. Well, I guess it's the visitor center. It used to be the control room. And when we got there, the guy says, um, so I have to apologize because we told you you were going to get set up on the pavement here. But the safety people, they didn't want people on the road for, because they want to be able to run ambulances if they have to. So instead, we can offer you some space over on the side of the hill. <laughs> and uh, so Padma, our principal investigator, she's more of a professional astronomer. So she's used to being in the control room, in climate control, and not on the side of the hill. So that's where Roy and I, I mean, we set up in fields all over the place. Okay, that's fine. We're cool. Um, Roy actually shoveled the sidewalk off here because it had a lot of, of rocks on it to make a nice space. So here we are setting up two of the, uh, of the mounts up here at the top. And then Roy and I actually set up down the hill a little ways because we didn't think we could fit three up at the top. And uh, that, was, that was fun. And so the gentleman asked us, he said, is there anything I can do for you? And we said, well, it'd be really great to have power. He goes, no problem. Okay. I said, uh, how about internet? He goes, no problem. Roy and I went out later that night, and by the time we got to the telescopes, there was power run to every, a really nice extension cord to each of the telescopes. By the next morning, there was wired internet run to each of the telescopes. Their facilities crew is awesome. I, I cannot say enough nice things about them. There's, there's ours. Beautiful sunset. So all we really did was set up, you know, our gear in a basic way so that they would know where we were and enjoy the sunset. And then, yeah, Roy and I took that hike. So, oh, it's uphill all the way and between 7,000 and 7,500 feet. I'm a lowlander. I've spent my entire life pretty much at sea level. That was a little bit of a hike then to, to chug up the hill, but, but we did. And then, for the first time in my life, I'm seeing the southern sky. So it's so easy to polar line a telescope when you have a convenient bright star kind of marking the spot. The southern <laughs> hemisphere just lacks that, right? And I made a picture for myself. And I actually could find Beta Hydrae. That's not too hard. But to find Sigma Octans, a sixth, ah, maybe it's fifth. But anyway, it's a dim star in the middle of a whole lot of stars. Oof. But we gave it a shot. We, we did the best we could. But yeah, that was exciting. Um, this is not the best picture I've ever taken. I probably should have amped it a little bit here for... For this but that really bright thing that's jupiter like right up there straight overhead and, and you can just make out scorpius here there's the oh head. yeah yeah it doesn't you know how the moon looks big on the horizon well i think scorpius looks big because it's on our horizon so it doesn't look that big up there overhead but yeah the skies are stupidly nice all right, so by the next morning, they brought a table, they brought chairs, they put power and internet. We were set. So the telescope itself there is an 80 millimeter diameter, 500 millimeter focal length uh, refractor from Daystar filters. Uh, we had a Thousand Oak solar filter on the front for most of the day. And then the uh, Celestron, oh heck, what'd they call it? A CG4 mount. Um... You might notice if you were a close observer and, and you were kind of a mount snob, you would notice that those are not Celestron mount legs. And they're not. Because the Celestron mount legs, you had to take them apart to make them fit into a standard suitcase. And to do that, you actually have to break a glue bond to get the set screws out. And I didn't, it's Spencer's telescope, it's not my telescope. I really didn't want to do that. so. Those are the legs from my Orion um, EQ2 mount borked onto this. So 
it worked really well. Also, they're flat, they're aluminum, they didn't weigh as much. Um, and I had asked some people who traveled internationally with telescopes, I said, what piece did uh, security object to the most? And they said, the counterweight. They didn't understand why we had a chunk of iron. I go, all right, why do we have a chunk of iron? I mean, there are rocks all over the landscape here. What I ended up taking were some of the weights that you can put around your wrist or ankles for running. They have a nice Velcro. The telescope itself was light enough that I only needed like really a two to three pound weight on the, and I took counter shaft staff extension. So anyway, I, I didn't take a big chunk of iron. So everything I could to cut weight. But uh, yeah, it was a great day. So we spent that entire day basically trying to get the telescope to be exactly polar aligned, ready to go the next day and doing some practice runs. Behind us, up underneath that visitor center was where the guys were setting up to do the live stream. They had a whole stinking studio crammed in up there. Soundboards, feeds from a number of telescopes, and, and wiring. I mean, the facilities guys wired them up really nicely, too. You just couldn't raise up your head too much too fast. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was amazing. Uh, down the hill from us was a group from Europe, and they also had a number of telescopes. Um, they were doing some polarization work as well. Um, they did some white light stuff and just some pretty picture taking. Um, and of course, everybody was basically spending the day going, oh crap, this isn't working. How do we fix it? Um, one of our crew burned out. They had a power supply that was not meant for the uh, 220 Chilean power. So luckily we brought uh -oh. back. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops. But uh, by sunset, we were pretty ready to go. And uh, there down in the left corner there, that is that radio telescope that had that pretty picture taken. Uh, I never did walk all the way out to that. They don't use it anymore, which is sad, but it's still sitting there. And the view is just amazing. Even though we're high, we're not that far from the ocean. So one of the cooler things was as the sun set, you, you can see the ocean out here. You know, you can see that flat horizon. And so my head is going because we're going to see the shadow coming, right? It's going to come at us from the ocean, and we're going to be able to see that. Um, by this time, it was hideously windy. You had to nail everything down or it would be over the other side of the mountain. And we were seriously worried about our kind of lightweight mounts. So I had actually brought some bags just for grins and giggles, and we weighted those down with rocks and hung them off the mounts just to keep everything from going places during the night. Um, we wrapped everything up. It was actually pretty clement at the peak, too. It could have been colder. They do get snow up there, um, and we did not see snow. Yeah, by night it was windy and cold, and you would want some... some warm weather gear, but when the sun was up, like the desert does, it, it warms up pretty fast. Uh, the telescope there, that's a 1.2 meter telescope, was opening up for the night. Um, there was a little temporary press tent set up down there, and again, it's surreally quiet knowing that there's going to be this crowd and people coming the next day. But we'll take it. And so, yeah, I spent a little bit of time on this night just with a tripod and my camera and the le and just out there taking <laughs> pictures. Um, you can just barely see the two Magellanic clouds poking up above the horizon low. Uh, of course, some, some people were driving on the street. The glow down here is La Serena. You can see it. But... Uh, but yeah, the Milky Way just going flat overhead like that, that, that's just absolutely fantastic. You know, and just so many stars. So that was, that was really fun. Uh, the next day, the wind died at daybreak. And you looked out and said, yes, 
clear skies. I saw Venus, you know, out our window in the morning. I said, I'll see you later. And, uh, yeah. We got to the mountain before the shadow had cleared because it's higher behind us than it is on that side. But there's that ocean out there. There's our setup. So if you've ever tried to look at a computer screen outside in the daytime, uh, it, it's tough. So we had these cute little tents that you could put the laptop into to see the screen, um, which worked actually really well. More cabling snaking off there across the rocks to somebody else's setup. At some point, the president of Chile was coming. He wasn't staying for the eclipse. I forget where he was going for that, but he was coming because there were school children here. He had a photo op. He wanted to say some nice things, so he came. And so people were waiting to, you know, watch for that. And there's that big telescope up on the hill. Wow, what a great place that would be to take pictures from. Uh, I didn't really have that that opportunity on Eclipse Day, but more on that later. Uh, of course, the sun was cheerfully blank. Ah. Uh, the nice thing about sunspots is they give you something to focus on. You know, the limb of the sun uh, isn't, you know, the atmosphere is doing things and it's, it's tough. Roy and I were playing a game like you would at the optometrist's office. Is this better or worse, right? And he'd tweak it a little bit, and, and then I'd have to respond. And so eventually you get it to where you just say, okay, that's good, leave it. Theoretically, we probably should have done another focus run really close to eclipse time, because again, temperature changes are not radical, but they're, you know, steep, but... I, we actually ended up with a pretty good focus for all that. But yeah, better or worse, better or worse. Um, and finally it starts. Um, I think that's one of the coolest things in the world that we can predict and say, this will happen on this date at this time in this place. And by golly, it does. And so it's always fun to see those first bites out of the sun. Here we are, two dorks on the hillside in Chile. Um, by this time, there were some other people sort of uh, on the hillside, a lot of them photographers of various news organizations. And the guy next to us was from Reuters. So he actually asked questions like, what exposure should he use for totality? And we gave him a good answer. So he took this picture and he asked if he could borrow our internet cable. And then he uploaded his picture right then and said, oh, they're using it. There you go. You're on the internet. <laughs> Our 15 seconds of fame. Um, you can see that Roy, Roy was born in Michigan, so he's always uh, warmer than I am, I think. So he's out there in his short sleeve shirt already. I've still got my hat on. But, uh, you know, it was slowly warming up as the day went on. And finally, it gets really, really, really small, and everybody's getting really excited. And bless my cell phone's heart. This is it trying to make the landscape lit just seconds before totality. And look at that shadow out there. We could definitely see the shadow coming at us from over the ocean. Um, that was too, fu too much fun. This is a 1 20th of a second shot, so I could not hold it still. But that was really fun and then totality. And that is Venus there down below the sun. Um, one of the other things that I didn't mind seeing the southern sky, I didn't mind seeing the constellations where they were, but seeing this, having to look north to see the sun, that's just very wrong. <laughs> yeah. it, it took a bit to kind of, yeah, that's right, it's, it's, we're going to have to look that direction. So here it is coming down because it was, oh, not that far from sunset when the eclipse actually happened. And there's a kind of an amp view, okay? So you can see I had these very photogenic uh, fuel tanks in front of me. Um, yeah, it wasn't where, if I was taking a beauty shot, this was not where I would have been, but that's okay. 
But there's the sequence, you know, from the camera going into totality, trying to pay attention to it while doing other things. And this is what the camera on the telescope was doing. Over and over again, eight exposures ranging from 0.13 milliseconds up to 400 milliseconds. Eight different exposures over and over again from the very start of totality, whenever we took that solar filter off and said go, till when we put the solar filter back on and said stop. Uh, we ended up with something around 800 uh, images And there's the end of it. You can tell when it's time, right? The, the diamond ring comes back and tells you, hey, it's time to cover back up again. So that was the end of the sequence. So pretty much the last images we took there, uh, the, the filter must have gone on between 872 and 873 there. But just uh, once you said go, you could pretty much ignore it. It was just going to do its thing. And one piece of advice I did get from Spencer, because Spencer had had, he had that Kate telescope because he was a Kate site in 2017, and he said when he took the solar filter off, he moved the telescope. So basically he was telling us, don't do that. <laughs> so it, it was just barely hanging on the end of, end of the tube, so we could just gently flick it off and, uh, and not move it. So when you take those sets of eight and the gentle person that was doing our data reduction took, you know, the best sets, combine them and sharpen the fool out of it, this is what you get. So that is a snapshot of the corona in, in some high detail that day. And we actually ended up with two stars in the frame, which, which surprised me. So one guy who I ID'd there and then another guy down here, real faint. Uh, there was a lovely prominence. Now the camera that, that we're using here is a monochrome camera, so everything's black and white, but to your eyeball, that prominence is this ridiculous burning shade of magenta. Um, I mean, H-alpha, yeah, it's red light, but that's it's something close to beyond red. It's really, really bright. So that was that was fun, and I was happy that, you know, we did a good job, we got good data. Roy and I were running a white light scope, the same setup as for the Kate 2017. The other two telescopes were running two different polarimeters. One was um, the same one they'd used in 2017, and the other was uh, the Blackfly camera. So they wanted to compare those two. And these are all three cameras, but two of them are showing polarized light, which is kind of fun, and those two uh, that's how they ended up when they colored them for, again, the different states of polarization. So the good thing is it looked like the black fly was just as good as the really more expensive thing. Um, and, and it worked out pretty good. Now, 2017 was a little bit higher on this, in the solar cycle. By 2019, the sun had just rolled over and gone to sleep. So it was interesting that I think you can see the difference here. Look at the sun in 2017 there on the right. I mean, the corona's got all kinds of stuff going on. Whereas we just had kind of a nice, you know, calm thing going on with ours. So, uh, yeah, there's differences in, depending on where you are in the solar cycle. So if you take the images, the two on the left are from the Caesar group down the hill, and the one on the right is using our image, and scale it to put it in. So the red is the one instrument in orbit, and the blue is the other. And so now you're looking at the corona for a long way out, but looking to see what's going on in our little space as well. So taking it all the way down to the surface. So they did a rather good job of smoothing their stuff out, and they had one camera that was doing uh, visual stuff and got the surface of the moon as well, which is kind of fun. So it's really interesting then to be able to see the corona all the way out from the surface. And uh, some of the results got published in the uh, Messenger, the ESO's uh, magazine, along with a very lovely cover photo. 
Um, my only complaint, and it's, it was mostly that the Kate data set, they wanted to make it public. As far as I know, that's never happened. And part of the reason for that is the pictures, the way they had the data captured, captured so little information that it's hard to make use of it unless you are doing, you know, some higher level stuff. MATLAB was used to make the data files, so you, to get that back out of those files, you needed MATLAB, which is not a free program. Um, since I had a son in college doing engineering, I actually had him whoops, pull some of the data out for me, and I was greatly distressed that all I had was a list of timestamps. Uh, that's not real useful. And even the data for each individual frame, all you had was the resolution of the camera, not even its name, and what time you took it. And that was it. So it, it's going to be hard for somebody to put this together in a way that makes sense, where you have everybody's data, how long each exposure was, and you have to account for that some of the frames get dropped, and, and make it sensible. So... Uh, yeah, it was a shoestring budget, and MATLAB donated their stuff, so you can't complain too hard about that. But, but uh, if they plan to do something like this in 2024, I, I want, I'm going to press hard. That I want to see open source stuff used. But uh, okay, so I had that, that. And yeah, there's the, oh, so when we go to 2024, the cool thing is we're going to be higher up on that solar cycle again. So that will also be interesting. So make your plans now. Where are you going to be? Um, the coast of Mexico is, is really nice. Um, I'm shooting for Texas myself. Uh, I went to school in Cleveland, Ohio, which is well in the path. Uh, I am not going to be in Cleveland, Ohio in April. <laughs> Zero chance of that. Um, this is what the uh, average cloud cover over the path looks like. So you can see why a lot of people will be going to Mexico. Hopefully by 2024, surely we are out of some of the foolishness and we can go places and do things, but... You just never do know. The day after the eclipse, get up, have to go through the burrows to get to breakfast. I asked if somebody feeds them out the kitchen. They said they're not allowed to. Yeah, okay, I think the burrows say different, but okay. <laughs> Ooh. But we got to, to glam on to a sky and telescope tour of the observatory, so... That's the big guy on the hill. I mean, big telescopes are just cool, right? They're just cool and neat and fun. Um, and look at the mirror. I mean, you could actually see the mirror. And all the little pads on the side that figure it while they're, you know, observing. So from the balcony outside the big guy, I look out. And I take a very nice picture. I'm thinking, yeah, this, this looks pretty nice here. You got the whole observatory laid out underneath you. And then when we got back to civilization and I'm running through what nice pictures people submitted to astronomy picture of the day. Guess what? Yeah. Ah! So those dogs up there that day, <laughs> that really was the place to be. I mean, they had a great vantage point. But I was just struck at how similar i mean it's the exact same picture right except one day difference um that's where we were on eclipse day so i can say that i am in the a pod <laughs> I'm actually there but um but yeah that that's kind of fun and you can actually see them in my picture here you could see these guys in their little tripods yeah they were right up there ah you can't do two things, right? You have to be doing one thing during an eclipse, and you're either taking pictures or you're running an event or you're doing something. And uh... So then the other uh, telescope we spent some time at was this one. It's called the New Technology Telescope. Now, it was new in 1989. Uh -huh. But it was the first telescope in the world to use adaptive optics. 
And so that was why new technology. The dome design is also ventilated in a way that makes the air flow smoothly across the mirror, which also helps to keep the view nice and sharp. And again, you could basically walk right up to it, see its little actuators. And then looking back from there, you would, our little lonely table was still out there. So that's where we had been the day before. They hadn't yet picked up everything. Uh, they did not want people flying drones. I wonder why. Uh. <laughs> you know, that would have been such an annoyance. Yes. So this is what the control room looks like. So from here, all the domes on the hill are controlled. They have, you know, different stations for each one. But they're not even at the telescope on the mountain. They're all in a building by themselves. Um... I imagine there might be somebody there just in case, you know, you need to tweak the instrument or whatever, but otherwise people are just down here. You're picking out your target, you know, telling the telescope and the instrument to do what it needs to do. And uh, that's exciting. So from there, we drove back to, to La Serena. Uh, the exciting part about making the trip, by the way, is from La Serena to La Silla, there are no gas stations. So if you're driving or somebody who's driving you, they have to be able to make it there and back on the tank of gas. <laughs> Things that we do take for granted maybe here, not so much some other places. But this is the moon the night after the eclipse. So what did I figure it was? 26 hours. And... Uh, and then uh, big letters are a thing, I think, in this part of the world. So the beach has its own set of letters. You have to pose to, you know, do the thing. You don't know how long I waited for there not to be people on it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, again, a very lovely, clement night. And the next day we spent a few hours before, we took a night flight out the next day, you know, thinking we could sleep going back. I don't, I don't sleep on planes. Maybe some people do. Um, but it was a good idea anyway. So we did some sightseeing. Um, there is a uh, railway up the mountain in Santiago that's well worth doing. The, you know, it's a very nice uh, panorama from up there to see the mountain. Um, so it's a fun place, a uh, lovely country. Everybody was very friendly. There was a soccer tournament going on, so there was a lot of excitement about that. Um, and again, most people speak enough English that, that you can communicate. Um, and the food was great. So anyway, anybody have any fun questions? And I will stop. So Theo, before anybody else unmutes, uh, I want to make sure I get the ones that were. Where do you get the laptop tent? Oh, um, that's uh, a Good question, and I know I have a link to that that I can send along. It's it's four cameras, um, and, and you know, with the idea that you know, a lot of times you're using a laptop with a camera. Well, I thought it might be like for the puppy dog or something. No, it's actually meant for photography, so it's it's very black on the inside. Oh, great! Uh, somebody suggested that if you need to work on your focus, uh, you know, find something at a great distance. <laughs> Yeah, um, of course, you're looking through the solar filter was the problem. I mean, you could have, if we had nothing else or we, we were really having trouble, yeah, we, we could have done that. Um, but yeah, we, we wanted it to be as close to what you had. So yeah, you were used, and they actually wanted you to take that step through program had a focus section where you actually would take some images and they could evaluate how good the focus was. Um, I, I didn't find it super helpful, um, but, you know, some people did. That's, that's about all I can say. Um, I had a question, which was when you t said you got 872 images or whatever, is that 100 back in sets? Yes. Okay. That's what I thought. 100 sets of eight images. And, you know, yeah, the, the little Arduino had a GPS unit so that it knew where it was and, and could accurately timestamp. 
Um, that was more important for 2017 when they were trying to combine people's images and you wanted to know exactly when they were taken. Yeah. A um, little bit less important. Although we actually had, so there were three of us on the mountain. There was another set of people at, um, oh shoot, the other observatory that was also in the path, but they did not take visitors. So there was a group down there with, this, with the Kate camera and set up. And then we had another guy on the beach at La Serena. And uh, he had some cloud issues. Um, beaches are kind of like that too, but, um, but he also was there. So we actually did have a couple of groups doing the same thing there. Let's see, let me stop that so we can kick back to everybody. There we go. And uh, Theo, I was just going to mention that uh, uh, you, uh, oh shoot, I can't think of what her name is now. Uh, but one of the people at the solar eclipse planning workshops had given an excellent talk. And basically for years after coronagraphs and digital cameras, a lot of astronomers stopped taking data at total solar eclipses until that quandary of we can't see the area just above the solar surface. And so that all of a sudden has taken on a much more critical uh, yeah. aspect to understanding the sun. And so, it's, it's pretty clear that, that whatever's happening, it's, it's that transition zone, you know, that's really important. How do you move that energy out in that way to really amp those electrons to being so darned hot. So if you want to ask questions, now is a great time. I'll let you unmute yourselves or I can unmute everybody and take a chance. <laughs> no questions? Come on, guys. Uh, you did not need a visa to go to Chile? Just a... Uh... Just a passport, so that was also good. You know, um, what software, if, if, if you can recall, what software did you use to combine the multiple images? So that was done by a gentle person, and they were actually using uh, a routine that he developed in IDL, which is a it's it's a programming thing that that professionals use i i am oh, well, i don't even know if i know what the letters stand for but so it was not using commercial software i see there are ways you can do it and there was actually a good sky and tell article about how to do this sort of thing and come out with a very similar image which um which i actually did at one point i had a hand at my own you know you have to make some guesses about uh, well, actually, I finally had to, I had to ask, what are the exact exposure lengths? Because nowhere in the recorded data was that piece of information. Oh. At, which really annoyed me. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, you would like to know that, right? Well, so, well, listen, this was fantastic. I, um, on behalf of CAS, I want to thank you for um, the time and effort you put into this. It, very helpful. Yep. And I would encourage you, you know, if you get the chance to go somewhere to see an eclipse, um, part of the experience is always, you know, enjoying what's going on, you know, in that country or place. You know, the eclipse only lasts a few minutes. So, right. you know, make sure you do all the other stuff. It's like going to... Have... Go ahead. I, I, I have a question. I, I don't understand the sets of eight pictures. It looked like set of eight pictures went from dark to real bright to dark. Yep. So the dark, what is one, the dark ones aren't as dark as you think they are. And but they're capturing the fine detail really close to the to the sun that's going to get blown out by the later stuff. And you can combine the images in a way that tells the software ignore the bright, the really bright stuff in the subsequent frames. We're only going to add information outward and and that way because the corona goes for a long way but increasingly faint so those last few super burned in exposures were for the far stuff and those first really dark looking ones were for the stuff just really close to the sun 
So it, like take a tiny picture and, that, and then expand the picture and... No, you're actually just, um, and some cameras do this inside the camera now where you can say, let's say you have a scene where you're shooting into shadow. Mm -hmm. And you know, our eyes see that really stinking well, but cameras don't. Right. They tend to render the shadows really dark. Well, you can ask your camera to do three exposures and combine them, and it will do it using the same kind of a process where it'll lift the shadows up, but not blow out the sunny part so that you get a more correctly exposed picture. And that, that's essentially what you're doing. You're taking them and stacking them one on top of each other, each set of eight. And so what you ended up with, I think 60 of our sets um, got used to, in the sharpened picture. And that was just mostly because 60 sets is always gets rid of some of the noise in the background. Mm -hmm. But even one set of eight, you would get that whole then trip from the, the surface of the sun all the way out to the faint stuff without blowing it out. Uh -huh. it, it's a fun thing to do. And to some extent, some people do that on pictures of like the Orion Nebula, for example. It's very easy if you're trying to get the faint wispy stuff, but you don't want to overexpose the center, which is really, really bright. Yeah. And so you have to do some shenanigans where you're combining you know, different exposures of different lengths to do that. Mm -hmm. I was just gonna, is, I was just gonna give an example that uh, if you had like cut an onion in half and you have all the rings, yeah. So mm -hmm. that, yeah, each each exposure is a different ring. Uh huh. And uh, okay, neat. Thanks. The challenge is to do it so it's smooth. Um, you know, my first attempts looked like an onion, but it was. <laughs> 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 But yeah, I, I think this is going to get rewritten. You know, it's a generational thing, right? Um, the gentle person that was doing our data, he's, he's sort of retired now. So their language was IDL. The people all coming up do Python. So the next version of all this stuff is going to get written in Python, which is open access and free and just all around easier for people to contribute to. Um, there's also a wonderful piece of software that people use for planetary uh, photography called Fire Capture. And at the time they were planning 2017, they asked the gentleman who developed that if he could do that sort of a thing, taking a set of exposures over and over and over again. And at the time, the software could not yet do that. I wish they had taken the next step and said, could you make that happen? because he's responded to the most ridiculous requests from amateurs. Can you do this feature, that feature? And he does. If they had asked, I think he could have done that. And that would have, I think, saved a lot of grief. But it's interesting when you work at that intersection between the professionals who have one way of doing things and the amateur group who have another set of tools, um, it's, it's sometimes an interesting interface. Mm -hmm. uh, are you going to be doing anything for 2023 or 2024? Well, um, it has not escaped people's notice that there's this box in Texas where you could be in the same place for both, mm -hmm. weather willing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as much as I, I would like to say, you know, I'm just going to find a space of land and sit on it and enjoy it and take pretty pictures and ignore all the other static. But then, you know, you think, but, 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 so I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I have thought semi-seriously of just calling up the Careville School District and saying, so, Careville, you have two events that all your students need to see. I can help. <laughs> we will not burn anybody's eyes out. I promise you that. And uh, let's have a fun day and do some education along the way. It is actually a ton of fun to... Um, in Kentucky, I was in the stadium with mostly middle school kids. And I knew they would, and they did not disappoint, that they would scream when we hit totality. Uh -huh. So that is, it, it's so much fun to see that reaction. And, and, you know, and yeah, we burned nobody's eyes out. I hope we can get past that for this next eclipse. Um, 
we had people one of my jobs was to go around to school districts and we were trying to convince them to bring their kids to the stadium uh, the, the Kentucky Department of Transportation was doing their level best to dissuade them from doing that oh it'll be an apocalypse their children will be stuck on the road they will all die of dehydration in the school buses so anyway <laughs> um, he's not exaggerating I, I'm not that, that was completely the argument um, so one district though the guy says I can bring every student. He was the only people person that had enough buses. We're like, great. Three weeks before the eclipse, he calls and he says, uh, I can't bring all the students. Go, Why not? He said, because some of our board members are worried, and, and I take this somewhat seriously, that the second coming will happen, and they don't want the kids not oh, at school. So, oh, and my flip answer, and I'm glad I wasn't at the school board meeting, would have been the kids can be raptured from Bowling Green just the same as they could here, but you you know you can't <laughs> say that. So um, we lost kids to that. We lost kids to teachers who were just, and it's the younger teachers' kids who are most paranoid, and the younger kids are the ones who will not look at the sun. They'll look once and they'll get a face full of sun and they won't do it twice. Teenagers. <laughs> are your biggest problem because they're stupid enough to actually stare. <laughs> and honestly, the only person I talked to in all the talks, I would ask, you know, one guy said, I did, I, I have eye damage from looking at the sun. I said, okay, what did you do? He said, I was in the Navy. We were bored. We dared each other. How long could you stare at the sun? <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's how you do it. The sun is just as dangerous to look at the other 365 days a year as it is yeah. on the day of the eclipse. Now I will have to say that, and again, I can never tell anybody else what to do because I might do something that I would never recommend. I was doing a, a broadcast online with some people from time and date, and it was about two minutes out from totality and it was getting darker and darker. And I finally said, I got to go because I was under the stadium deck. So I ran out, and what do you do? You look, right? It's like a storm is coming. So I look back at the sun, expecting, I think, to get a face full of sun, and instead, I could see the crescent. And in that moment, you have to be able to tell yourself, no, <laughs> look away, get the filter back out, camera up with the filter on, and start taking pictures. But yeah, I can see how in that last moment you could stare because you could. No, I mean, the rest of the time you can't. Not, not reasonably anyway. So teachers had fun. They made really cute little pie plate things where they put the solar viewers in the middle and then had these huge pie plates to make them feel better about they're not going to peek around the edges. Um, some of our school districts had great fun events and beautiful days and, you know, it was fun to be a part of that. We gave away over 100,000 pairs of solar viewers to schools in Kentucky for free. We <clears throat> found somebody who would sponsor that. And when you do it at that level, you can get them stupid cheap per, per viewer. So, um, you know, we worked with the vendors and got just piles of those things. Um, I, you know, I could say too, maybe I'll make money because there has not yet been an eclipse where there were too many solar glasses made. Doesn't happen. People are always looking for them. Chris can vouch for that. <laughs> she's in totality and she's looking for them. So, yeah, you can make some serious cash. And again, I would pitch that to school districts, man. If your PTSA is not selling solar glasses, I don't want to, I don't want to hear about it. You need to be. You should be. Put your logo on it. Have a contest. You know, whatever. Anyway, so outreach is kind of and I blame Chris for this, something I really enjoy doing. It's so much fun to be involved with people and, and to try to do something that's special and fun. And an eclipse is for most of us a once in a lifetime event. So, you know, somewhere I'll find myself doing something I feel like, but, but if I had my way, I think that's where I would be is in Careville, find, if they have some photogenic place, find a spot and, take the same picture from both locations but I, I haven't gone there yet to scout it out that that's on the list <laughs> oh me but anyway that's 
That's what I know about the future. No. Questions? Questions? Crickets? Crickets? <laughs> cicadas. <laughs> yeah, cicadas. No, Theo is, uh, uh, I call her the, the eclipse evangelist. Um, I don't know how many talks and things she gave to parks and libraries and everybody else. And I went a little crazy. A little crazy, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, I'm, I, I'm, I'm already wrestling with what I'm going to do in 2024 because it's only 93% here. Uh, I'd have to go to Cleveland or Texas. Um, and it's, it's hard. Yeah. because we know that there's going to be people here who want to experience it who can't make the trip uh april 8th in 2024 is the monday after eight days after easter it's like if it had been the day after easter you might have been able to get more people to make the ride to take the ride to go and see totality yeah. but um, and I'm not really counting on the weather up here. So anyway, we could be, I mean, my sister yeah. lives in Texas and she's within the, um, path of totality. But oh, there you not go. On the sun. <laughs> so we're all dropping in, right? <laughs> <laughs> we can park the camper there. <laughs> but April can be iffy. April can be iffy. In Texas, <laughs> you think? We could be changing. Uh, yeah, home. she's in northern Texas. So it depends what part of Texas you're in. But she's just north of Dallas. But uh, so mm -hmm. I know several people on this call have uh, experienced totality. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Fred Espinak said uh he wrote a, he and his wife wrote a book about uh, a kid's book for about traveling to the eclipse and the way they described it uh the difference between totality and 98 or 99 percent is the difference between eating an ice cream cone and looking at a picture of an ice cream cone yeah that's a safe analogy that you can use with everybody. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, or smelling barbecue and eating barbecue. So, <laughs> but uh, no, um, you, I you thought. Want Bud, you want Bud Hamblin's? Uh, is it clean? It's not too bad. So, but Bud is uh, one of our senior members. Uh, I don't even know how old Bud is, but. Um, his was, it's like the difference between holding hands with your sister or pitching woo. So. Or pitching what? Woo. That, that's a kind of a, a Brit euphemism, but. I don't know what it means. Um, making whoopee. Um, yeah, making whoopee. Oh, there you okay, go. okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to, uh, oh, what was the show called? Oh, uh, are, can I help? What was it? Are you served or are you being No, no, no. I'm talking about for making whoopee. Oh, oh the newlywed game. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the newlywed game. But uh, yeah. But hopefully 2023, 2024. Theo, let me know if you need someone to carry gear. I mean... <laughs> The, the fun thing, I guess, about all this is we all know a whole lot more now about doing remote broadcasting. So yeah. we, we can do events from where we are. Um, I yeah. know an obnoxious amount about uh, open broadcast software. Um, you, you're not surprised I help out with the church uh, live stream, so. Yeah, yeah. but uh, um, yeah, and let's see. Uh, is when I first started reading astronomy, 
for uh, actually astronomy wasn't even as widely read as sky and telescope at the time. And that was like the place. So, oh man. <laughs> the food was very, very good. Um, the, 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 and I don't know where the box lunches day of, they actually brought box lunches to all of us at, at the telescopes, which was again, wow. super sweet. Um, and I don't know where they came from because, uh, you know, literally there's no place around there. Wow. Wow. Oh. Hospitality. Yeah. Well. Oh, anyway. Yeah. Does anybody else have questions or other things you want to discuss? Um, Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. If you're ever in Nashville, holler. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, the Barnard Seifert Astronomical Society, E.E. E. Barnard, Carl Seifert, both have ties to Nashville. Um, and um, <clears throat> hopefully we will be, oh, I know what I was going to mention. So there was a planetarium show produced called Big Astronomy, People, Places, Discoveries. And it actually uh, was produced to highlight three of the Chilean observatories, the equipment, the, observ the observations that they make, but also very much the people who are involved. Everybody thinks of the astronomer through the eyepiece, looking, you know, squinting through the eyepiece, uh, a la Edwin Hubble, uh, but the, the fact of the matter is, is it's engineers and uh, uh, construction workers and all these other trades, you know, the guys who keep the telescopes running and keep them clean. And uh, it's kind of like space exploration. You don't think of seamstresses as having an integral role, but they do. And uh, so, uh, we're hoping uh, we're going to be previewing big astronomy for the members of the CERN and Earth and Space Center, and then uh, we will be running that for the general public here in the not too distant future as well. So for those of us who can't go to Chile. <laughs> I told them if they needed somebody to go to Antarctica this next time and had money to do that, I would be totally up for that. I, I don't did, have not heard anybody has money for that. Uh, oh man. So anyway, gang. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Theo. No, thank you. Okay. It was great. Bye. Great talk. Thanks thank you. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have Thanks, Chris, for Chicago. setting it up. Uh hoping to have uh Maybe a public star party at the Space Center. Probably the earliest will be about December the 11th is right now, I think, the date that we're looking at. Um, still trying to, you know, maintain safe uh, circumstances for everybody involved. But uh, can't wait to get outside with everybody and uh, enjoy. We've got planets in the evening sky. Come by and pick up a, an Abrams Sky Calendar from Michigan. It's got all the great stuff that you can look for between now and then. So hope to see you all live and in person very soon.